12, beginning of verse 16, and the word of the Lord reads, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool this night, thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. Time's up. All pencils down. Now, the title for my message this morning is Time's Up, All Pencils Down. <laughs> How do you like that for a visual aid, huh? Master, we thank you, God, for this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your word, for we know that above everything else, the word of God is exalted today. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. As the word of God would go forth this morning, we pray, God, that your anointing would rest upon your messenger. Help us, God, to deliver this word in a fashion that brings glory and honor to your name. Let every soul be touched, every heart be enlightened. God, today, lift us up to higher heights in you than we've ever before known. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Most of us remember during the days of our youth that we often were required to take timed tests. Remember when you were a kid in school and, you know, they'd take those IQ tests and all that kind of stuff and the, and the various proficiency tests and they'd be timed. You'd only have a certain amount of time. And the teacher would set the egg timer, or she'd do whatever, check the clock, whatever she had to do. And then when the time would come, she'd ring a bell, or clap her hands, or just yell out, Okay, pencils down, all pencils down. And you had no more time. Right at that moment, you had to lay your pencil down. Whether your pastor failed, that's it. You couldn't change it at that point. It was done, it was finished, it was complete. This is the situation with our primary text this morning. If you notice, there's a very wealthy man who finds that his crops have been abundantly plentiful and he's done a, a marvelous job of raising some beautiful fruits and vegetables and he realizes that, you know what, if I build bigger barns, I will have enough to keep me for years and years and years to come and I can just live it up and have a life the Bible said eat, drink, and be merry. And we've all heard the old saying eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we shall die. Amen? And uh, so this man's mentality was well now I can just eat, drink, have a good life and enjoy myself. And Jesus gave this parable to help illustrate for us that this man was providing for himself without any thought whatsoever of God. And you know, there are a lot of people living their lives this morning, and they don't think at all about God. They don't think at all about the reality that one day they're going to stand before the Lord in the judgment. One day they're going to answer to God for every single deed that's been done in the flesh. Amen? Isn't that what the Bible tells us? And they don't think about God. The Bible said that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I've tried to explain to people many times, when you read the term in Scripture, the fear of the Lord, it doesn't mean you're supposed to be terrified of God. It doesn't mean you're supposed to be afraid of God. What it means is, quite literally, you're supposed to give God a place in your thinking. So that when you live your life day to day, decisions that you make, 
are always made with God in mind. You know, when you're thinking about taking that change, that extra change that the lady at the CBS gave you, she gave you that $5 bill back when she was only supposed to give you a $1 bill, and you're thinking, hee hee hee, nobody sees, nobody knows, I can go home and be $4 richer. But because you're a Christian, you say, no, I can't do that, that wouldn't be right. And you say, young lady, you gave me too much change. Instead of giving me a one, and this just happened to me the other day, a gal, uh, mom and I had gone to Denny's, and I asked the young lady for change for a five, that she could give me five singles, and she came back and she handed me some singles, and as I began to count them, there was one single, there was two singles, there was three singles, there was four singles, and then there was a five dollar bill. She had given me the five dollar bill back, accidentally, thinking it was one of the singles. Now I gave her five dollars so I could get five singles back and I wound up with nine dollars back. Now I easily could have walked away and been ahead of the game. But I'm a child of God and God's people don't act like that. Amen? Because in our thinking we always give God a place in our thinking. We're always reminded and we're always mindful of the reality that one day we're going to face God in the judgment. So I went up to the cash register and I said, Honey, you gave me too much change. You gave me back my five in place of a single. So now I've worked for days. And I know that if your drawer come up short this evening, when you're done, that it could really cost you. And it could cost people their job. And she said, oh, thank you. She said, oh, my goodness, oh, Lord. She said, yes, if our drawer comes out short, she said, they'll take it out of our check. So thank you so much for giving that back to me. I said, you're welcome. But you see, that's the difference between this man in our story who lived his life without any thought whatsoever of God and somebody who is mindful. Hey, you know what? Everything I do, everything I say, everywhere I go, I'm mindful of the fact that there is a God. I'm mindful of the fact that one day I'll answer to Him. It may not seem like much down here, but in eternity, suddenly things are going to be magnified and it's going to look a whole lot bigger, amen, when we stand before God in the judgment. Well, I want you to know we used to take those tests when we were kids, those timed tests, just like I did this morning with y'all. And the teacher would say, all pencils down. And that meant, hey, it's over. Stop. You can't do anything else. Whether you've passed or whether you've failed, it is now determined, period. It's on paper. There's nothing more that can be done. And in our primary text this morning, this is exactly what God said to this rich man. For the Bible tells us that after he built bigger barns and after he put all his possessions in the new barns and he was saying, oh, now I'm just going to live it up because I've got all this to rely upon. The Bible said that God called him a fool and said, thou fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. All pencils down. You're following me today. Whether you passed or failed, tonight's the night, baby. You see, when death comes, that's God saying, all pencils down. When we finally come to the end of this life, whether we have passed or whether we have failed, there's nothing that can be done anymore. We can't fill in one more little circle. We can't write in one more little answer. We can't write one more essay question. No, it's all over. The test is done. It's all over. Stop where you're at. All pencils down. Now it's time to take the score. Now's the time to see whether or not we've passed this thing. Am I telling the truth this morning? Amen. God called this man into account. We have to understand this morning that death is not used as a punishment in and of itself. See, a lot of people, we look at death like it's a punishment. Why did Tammy Faye die so young? She was only 65. You know, that's not old in today's world. 
Was she being punished for some reason? No, it's not. Death is not necessarily a punishment. But it is the Lord calling us to account for ourselves. Amen. It is the Lord saying, okay, all pencils down. No time remains to make things right. No time remains to set things in order. When one behaves so grievously that the Lord chooses to call them home, that's his way of saying, okay, folks, all pencils down, no more time, whether you have passed or whether you have failed, we'll now see. The Bible said it is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. You see, a lot of times we have read the story in our Bibles in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, of Ananias and Sapphira. And we've read the story how that these two people had sold some property that they had and acted like they were doing like the rest of the church was doing and bringing the proceeds from that sale and laying it at the apostles' feet when in reality they were holding back part of the sale price because they wanted a little extra out of the deal. Now everybody else was bringing the whole sale price and giving it to the apostles so that needs could be met. And Ananias and Sapphira decided they were going to try to uh, defraud God. I got news for you this morning. You're never going to pull the wool over God's eyes. Amen. There's a lot of people that they think because they're fooling the preacher, they're fooling God. Hello now. They think because they're fooling mom and dad, they're fooling God. They think because, well, my partner doesn't know, therefore God doesn't know. Wrong. And Ananias and Sapphira, we know, according to the story, that they were literally struck dead, that they fell dead to the ground. And many of us would read that story, and immediately we would think, Oh boy, God punished them by causing them to fall dead to the ground. That was a punishment. No, not necessarily. But it was God saying, You know what? All pencils down. I want you up here right now to account for yourselves. I want you in front of me right this second to account for yourself. Does that mean that Ananias and Sapphira necessarily split hell wide open in a hand basket? No. Amen. You hear me now? No. It doesn't mean that at all. You see, that's the mistake. I think a lot of churches you go to, when they read the story of Ananias and Sapphira, it's automatically assumed that if God struck them dead, surely he tossed them into hell, you know. Of course, that had to be how things happen. No, 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 no. It's not how things have to happen. And I'm going to prove to you momentarily by Scripture that that's not how things have to happen. Sometimes the Word of God tells us that the body is given over to destruction, but the spirit is saved. Amen. So their body was given up. God said, okay, you forfeited your life. All pencils down. Now I want you to account. I'm going to stop this test right now. And whether you pass or fail, it's going to be set in stone. Amen. I remember I was attending an Assembly of God church in East Texas some years back. And there was a man in the church who was very, very disruptive, very, very problematic. And I went into the pastor one day and I said to the pastor, he was a friend of mine, I said, Brother Allen, I have a word from the Lord for you. See, when you have a prophetic ministry, these things happen sometimes. And I went in and I said, I've got a word from the Lord for you. And you ask any member of our church if this doesn't happen on a regular basis around here, and they'll tell you, oh, it happens. So the Lord told me, don't worry about that man, because he's about to remove him. And Brother Allen looks at me and said, what do you mean, remove? I said, I believe the man's going to die. Again, does that mean just because God takes his life, does that mean that he's automatically in hell? No. But it means all pencils are down. 
you're being called into account right now for your conduct. Are you following what I'm saying? Lo and behold, not even two weeks later, this man was leaving his house, stepped out onto the front porch of his house, turned around to his wife to say, bye-bye, honey, I'll see you tomorrow, whatever he says. Give her a kiss, whatever he does. And he literally dropped dead on his front porch. They said it was a massive heart attack. His wife, screaming and hollering at the funeral, said, How? He never had a heart condition. He never had heart trouble. He never had any problems with his heart. How could he just drop dead with a massive heart attack? I'll tell you how. Because God said all pencils down. You see, death is not necessarily a punishment, but it is a calling to account. It is God saying, okay, you know what? See, long life, we look at long life as a blessing sometimes. Like my grandmother has got diabetes, high blood pressure. she got everything, you know, hemorrhoids, you name it, she's got it. And she's lived so far to be almost 78 years old. She's only 400 pounds. So we keep thinking, holy mackerel. For someone with all her health issues and someone with her weight and all, it's a miracle she's lived to be as old as she is, and it is. And many times we think, well, that's a blessing from God that she's lived to be as old as she is. And the Holy Ghost spoke to my heart this week, and he said, no, it's not a blessing from God, it's my grace. Your grandmother has hurt more people, including her own children, with her mouth over the years. She's done more things to more people and been more hurtful and more offensive to people. And her long life is not a blessing, it's grace. Well, what do you mean by that, Brother Mark? I'm allowing her time to set things right before I end the test. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There's a lot of people, you know the old saying, only the good die young. Haven't you heard that? Only the good die young. The bad guys live to be, for, you know, they live to be nice and old. Well, of course they do. That's the grace of God. Because God's giving them more and more time to set their accounts right. I remember when Brother Gillum died. I was so devastated. I was sick for four days when that man died because I loved him so much. And he wasn't but in his early 70s when he passed. He was fairly young by today's standards. But you know what? He was ready. His account was settled. There was no need to hang around here. He didn't have anything left to do that was undone. You follow what I'm saying? And then when Sister Gillum, after he passed, Sister Gillum told her daughter, Barbara, I miss your dad. I miss JT. And Barbara said, well, Mom, we all do. And Sister Gillum said, yeah, but honey, you're in your 50s now, and you have children, and they have children. You've got your own family. So y'all don't need me here anymore. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go home. My account is settled. My business is finished. I want this test to be over. Isn't it wonderful when you finish the test before the teacher says all pencils down and you're sitting there just waiting for her to say the test is over so you can go out and recess? So you can get out in the playground and play? You're all done! Everything's done! Everything's finished! And Sister Gillen said, I've done finished this thing! I'm all done with it! I'm just waiting for the teacher to say all pencils down! And Barbara said, oh, Mom, don't say that! We need you! We need you here. And, and Sister Gillen said, no, you don't, honey. You don't need me anymore. I'm ready to go. And it was just days, weeks later, Barbara went to pick her mom up one day. They were going to go shopping. And her mother didn't come to the door when she rang the bell, so she let herself in with a key that she carried in her purse. And she walked into her mom's bedroom where she and her dad had slept together for some half a century and there was Sister Gillum in her sleep all 
already in the presence of Jesus. No sickness, no disease, no cancer, no stroke, no heart attack. The doctor said, no, she just died. She just expired. All pencils down. We're ready. Let's go. Amen. See, death is not a punishment. Even when you read in the scripture where God strikes people dead sometimes. Now in some instances it is. I'm not saying that always isn't. But I'm saying that there are many instances like Ananias and Sapphira where it's not really a punishment. But it is God saying, you know what, you're going to stand up in front of me right now. I'm not going to give you time to correct the error that you just made. Do you hear what I'm telling you? I'm not going to give you time to fix what you just broke. I'm going to call you into account this very moment. We had a man in our church. I'm not going to go into the whole story. To make a long story short, he and his wife stole some money from our little thrift shop that we had operating to try to help the church. And I told him, I said, you know, that's not a good thing that you did. I said, God struck Ananias and Sapphira dead for similar conduct. Six months later, this 43-year-old man dropped dead of a heart attack in his bed. 43 years old. Do I believe he's suddenly in hell just because the Lord shortened the length of his days because God called him? No, I don't believe he's in hell. But I believe that God said, listen, I gave you six months to make this thing right, and you didn't. So now, today, thy soul is required of thee. Just like I said to the rich man in the primary text today, now your soul is required. Do you follow what I'm saying today? Amen. I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 5, the word of the Lord speaks of death not necessarily being a punishment. It says to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So sometimes God will cause our life to be forfeited even though our soul will still be saved. Do you follow what I'm saying? So when Ananias and Sapphira were called into account, that doesn't mean they were lost for eternity. It means they were called into account for their actions right then and there, and not one more moment was given to them to make anything right or to correct their errors. Do you follow what I'm saying? You know, I say that a lot because I want to make sure people understand. I'm not just up here to flap my jaws. I'm here for you to understand what I'm trying to convey. So, well, Brother Moore, why is this even important to me today? I'll tell you why it's important, because every day that God gives us is not just another day to watch television and catch up on the soaps. No, every day that God gives us is another opportunity to correct an error. Amen. Is another opportunity to fix something we've broken. It's another opportunity to bring healing where perhaps in the past we brought hurt. I mentioned my grandmother as an example. I hate to have to use her as an example, but I, I can't think of anybody better. My grandmother has a way of opening her mouth and saying things that can be so hurtful to people and doing things that are so hurtful to people. And then she'll sit there and look at you like she's perfectly justified in everything that she does. You ever met anybody like that? Well, she did something recently that was very, very hurtful to both my mother and I. And on the telephone with her, I, I said to her, I said, listen, You can just die and all you can just die alone because I won't be calling you anymore. My grandmother and I, I've always tried to be close to her, even though she's a very difficult person to be close to. And I said, You can just die alone. Now why those words come off my lips, I don't know. I 
really don't. Those words just, it's just what come off my lips. I said, you can just die alone because I won't be calling you anymore. And not even a week later, or two weeks later, whatever it was, we got word that she has cancer all through her body. The doctors had not detected it before now. And that she has a very short time to live. So, wow. God really lowered the room on her, didn't he? I believe what God has done is, I believe God has said, listen, man, I've given you year after year after year after year after year after year after year to set in order things that you should have set in order. I gave you all this time to make right things that you did wrong. I gave you all this time to apologize and to repent of some of the things that you have done that hurt people. And you know what? You've never done it. You've never done it once. All pencils down. No more time. It's time now to stand before me and answer. And whether you pass or whether you fail, we'll find out. But there's no more time to make right. You know, usually when you're taking a test and you look at the clock and you see that, you know, time is passing, usually you start to really hurry and try to get done as much as you can get done, right? Usually when somebody gets word that their time is short and that their life is, is not going to be with them for very much longer, usually they're going to rush out and try to make some things right. Amen? Because they know, well, I don't have a whole lot of If I didn't think about setting things in order before, I'm sure thinking about it now. Because I'm looking at eternity right down the barrel of the gun, and all of a sudden it makes sense to me to try to set things in order. But you know what? I know people, and I've seen people, including my grandmother, they're looking down the barrel of the gun and they could care less. They're still smug, and they're still comfortable in their little box, like everything they've ever said was justified. Everything they've ever done was justified. And I think to myself, dear Lord, God could have struck you, the Lord could have taken you in your sleep just like that. But instead, you're faced with illness so that at least you have some time and you know what's coming. So you have a little bit of time to set your affairs in order and still you're not doing that. I want to read to you again a portion of scripture. First Corinthians chapter 11. A lot of times I think we've read this over the years, and again, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what God is saying here. First Corinthians chapter 11, beginning of verse 27. The word of the Lord reads, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, speaking of the Lord's Supper, unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now listen to this next verse. For this cause many are weak, and sickly among you, and many sleep. Did you hear what that said? For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you. People always ask, why does God allow believers, why do believers get cancer, why do believers get sick? And Paul just answered that question. Because when they come to the Lord's table, and this doesn't just necessarily mean the actual communion table, but when you come before the Lord, you come before Him and you're of such a proud spirit and such a haughty spirit that you have failed to examine yourself to see whether or not there's something there that might not ought to be. Again, I ask the question, you ever known anybody like that? 
They just don't even take the time to look at themselves and see if there's something there that might not ought to be there. They're so full of pride. They're so full of self. This is why I say when we do have communion, Communion's not a time. I, I remember growing up in the church. I remember over the years watching people decide that they weren't going to take communion this time because they didn't feel worthy or whatever. And they were afraid if they did, they'd get sick or die, you know. Dunkus. The whole point of communion is not this is the test. You ain't going to pass or fail. You know, if, if, you're, if you're right, then you take it. If you're not, you don't take it. That's not the point of communion. The point of communion is it is a time when we ought to look into ourselves and examine ourselves. Communion isn't about, you know, just the elements, the, the, the wine and the, the unleavened bread. No, communion is about self-examination. The fact that you feel that you're not worthy, the fact that you feel that somehow, some way, you may have failed the Lord and done the wrong thing or said the wrong thing or what have you, that very fact alone shows that your heart is in the right condition, hello now, to take communion. It's the people who come up time after time and don't even think about it that have to worry. The ones who never stop long enough to look inside and see if, well, you know what? I said something to that lady in the church the other day, and that might have been real hurtful. I might have really hurt her feelings. I, she's been walking around with a, a frown on her face ever since I said it, and I think I might have hurt her. You know, the Bible said that if you have hurt somebody, that you ought to go to them. Well, how in the world can anybody go to somebody else that you've hurt unless you're sensitive to the fact that you may have hurt them? Hello? Most people wouldn't even think about it. Most people wouldn't even be aware that they might have hurt the other person. But if we're examining who? The guy next to us? The lady behind us in church? No, ourselves. I preach in this church all the time. The only person you ought ever to be looking at is you. Amen. There's nobody else in this church that you should ever be judging, that you should ever be criticizing, that you should ever be examining. Hello now. The only person you should ever be looking at is you. And if we examine ourselves, then suddenly... Sometimes we'll realize, you know what? Ooh, I was I, I, the other day, just a couple weeks ago. Mom has a friend named Judy, and Judy came into town, and I went to lunch with them, and I was kind of crabby and kind of in a bad mood, and kind of you know just wasn't acting right. And the reason was I'd been up all night the night before, couldn't sleep, was having a lot of trouble sleeping. And Tommy will tell you, when I uh, don't sleep properly, I get very crabby. But after the fact, I examined myself. And I realized, oh Lord, you know what, I was awful crabby yesterday because I was so tired. And some of the things that I said might not have come across right to Judy and Mom, you know. So what did I do? I went to them and I said, listen, you know, the last time we went to lunch, I'm sorry, I was awful crabby. I hadn't slept and I was just in a terrible mood and I'm real sorry. Well, Judy said, I didn't even notice. I didn't, you know, I was fine. But see... That's what comes out of self-examination. Do you hear what I'm saying? When you look into yourself, that's when you begin to realize sometimes, well, you know what, I might have hurt that person over there, or I might have hurt that one over there. And now you have an opportunity to go and make it right. You remember when I preached on forgiveness some time ago? I, I preach things sometimes, I guarantee you'll never hear in any other church. 
I promise you, and I promise you it's wrong too, and it's biblical. And the reason you won't hear it in other churches is because they're preaching the same old garbage that they've heard for the last hundred years instead of preaching the Word of God. See, you go to a lot of churches and they're, they're more busy preaching what they've heard than they are preaching what it says. But in this church, I'm committed to preaching what it says. And if you remember when I preached some time ago about forgiveness, I talked about the fact that the biblical principle of forgiveness requires that the person who commits the offense must confess it. Hello now. You'll never hear that in another church. Oh no, you're just supposed to forgive everybody for the sake of forgiving them. Why that man who molested you when you were a child, you just forgive him to be forgiven him. Why that person who robbed you out on the street, you're just supposed to forgive him to forgive him. Well, there's a difference, and you heard me talk about this before, there's a difference between holding animosity, there's a difference between holding malice towards somebody. The person who molested you, the person who robbed you, the person who did you dirty in business, whatever the case might be, the parents who raised you horribly, whatever the case might be, you can not hold malice toward them, amen? You cannot be angry toward them. You don't have to be malicious and evil toward them. The Bible said, return not evil with evil, but return good for evil, amen? So you don't have to be malicious and evil just because somebody did you dirty or did you wrong. But in order to truly, genuinely forgive, the offender has to confess the offense. And that's scriptural. Jesus taught that. He said, if your brother sin against you. Now listen to the next line. And he repents forgive him did you hear what I just said he didn't say if your brother sins against you forgive him just forgive it see that's the attitude in a lot of Christian homes and in a lot of Christian minds oh we're just supposed to forget it and, and shove everything under the carpet Every bad thing that happens, we're just supposed to forget it and, and, and tuck it under somewhere. No, 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 no. That's very destructive. There are a lot of people to this day that are living with a lot of negativity in their lives all because somebody told them they had to shovel something under the rug. And that's not the way it ought to have been handled at all. Am I telling the truth? No, the Bible said if he come and repents, Forgive him. Even as God has forgiven us, we ought to have the same spirit of forgiveness so that if somebody comes to us and says, Hey, I'm sorry, I wronged you, no matter what the offense, God forgave us, we ought to forgive. But it doesn't mean we just forgive to be forgiven. But if they come to us the same way that we're required to do what? To confess our sins to God. The Bible doesn't say God just forgives us wholesale. No, it says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But what do we have to do first? Confess our sin. Hello. What does an offender have to do first? Confess their sin. They have to acknowledge it. And then when they come to us and they acknowledge it, we then can forgive. And this is the context in which... The Bible said, Whatsoever ye bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever, see, you hear preachers use that all the time on television. Oh, bless God, we're going to bind up this devil. We're going to bind up that devil. We're going to bind up this sickness. We're going to bind up that sickness. Hallelujah, glory to God. Everything we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. You idiot, that is not the context. Read it. Jesus was talking about forgiveness. He was talking about those in the church coming to one another and admitting their wrongdoing and admitting that they've hurt and admitting that they've wounded. And he said, forgive. And then he goes on to say, whatsoever you find on earth shall be done in heaven. What are you saying, brother Mark? What I'm saying is, 
if I hurt somebody and I go to them and I acknowledge that I've hurt them and they in turn forgive me. And those who've been in our church for any length of time have heard this message before. That matter is settled not only on earth, but it's settled in heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What does it mean, whatsoever you bind on earth? That you're going to tie it up, wrap it up in chains? No. In biblical times, if you had a contract and you had an agreement, you would tie it. And you would tie it with a knot. You'd bind it. Haven't you ever heard the saying, it was a binding contract? If you forgive me, that's a binding contract. You can't have a contract one way. Hello, contracts between two persons. It's between two parties. Forgiveness requires both parties, the offender and the offended. But if we've agreed that that matter is settled, then we have bound it. We've tied it up. It's done. And guess what? Whatsoever we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever we loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. If we have settled our account down here with one another, then it will not face us when we stand before God in the judgment. We will not face that issue when we stand before God in the judgment. That's why every day of life is important. Why? Because we can settle our business. We can correct our errors. We can go to people we've hurt. Look at AA. One of the principles of AA is that uh, you've got to go to folks who've been affected by your alcoholism and you've got to apologize. Why? Because that is so needful for healing. Not just for you, but for them. They need to hear you acknowledge that your alcoholism may have hurt them. They need to hear you acknowledge that your alcoholism may have caused them pain. Do you hear what I'm saying? They need to hear that the same way that when we've offended someone, they need to hear us acknowledge that. It's so much easier to forgive when somebody acknowledges the offense. Am I right? What about if you go to somebody? Because the scripture also said if you have ought against your brother, go to him. So now it's different because before, if you've offended them, go to them. But now it's the reverse. If they've offended you, guess what? You still have the right to go to them. And let them know, hey, you offended me. And then at that moment in time, they have the opportunity to do what? To repent and say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you. I didn't mean to, you know, to offend you. And at that moment in time, you are obligated to do what? To forgive. So every day of life that we have is an opportunity to set things in order and to make things right. So when we get to heaven, God willing, if we're smart, we're going to be a very big list that we're going to have to face. Why? Because we will have already bound a lot of these matters on earth. And because we bound them, because we settled them on earth, they're settled in heaven. We don't have to face them in the judgment. You follow what I'm saying today? So you see, when God sometimes calls somebody home because their conduct is so egregious or so bad, it's not necessarily a death sentence. It's not necessarily that they're going straight to hell. But it is all pencils down end of the test, now you're going to say, well, but Lord, I don't have time to, to set this right and to make this right and to fix. No, you don't. You had all the time in the world, but you didn't take advantage of it. Hello now. And now I'm requiring, like he said to the rich man in our story today, tonight thy soul is required of thee. Now I'm calling you into account right this minute. And if you've given wrong answers and all this time you had to go back and correct them and you didn't, oh well. Right? But for those of us that still are living and have life in our bodies, we have the opportunity this morning to go back and correct some of the answers that we've given.
And we've got the opportunity to go back and make right some of the things that we've done wrong so that we don't have to face these matters in the judgment. Okay, I'm going to call. I didn't preach like I normally preach at all this morning, did I? But part of the problem, I need to have my notes in front of me instead of having them over there. It's, it's not real comfortable. I'm going to have to fix that next week. But I hope you got the, an understanding of the message that I'm trying to get across to you this morning. You know, the time's going to come when every one of us is going to hear all pencils down. And it's going to be up to us to have settled our accounts. It's going to be up to us to have uh, looked over our tests one more time and seen if there were any answers that might not have been correct. It's up to us to examine ourselves and look and see whether or not there's something we can do to settle some matter, to make some matter right. You know, one thing I love about the old time Pentecostal church, a lot of your newfangled churches, you know, they believe in communion. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Yes, sir, we, God, we believe in communion. But ask them, do you practice foot washing? Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. I ain't getting down in nobody's feet and washing their stanky little claws. No way. But you know, 